We're going to move on to healing. Healing is another subject that's controversial that should not be. Okay, because the Bible is ripe with examples of healing. From the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry to, to the very end of, uh, you know, you read in the book of Acts and the, the life of the church, you see reports of healing and healing and healing and deliverance and healing and deliverance. And you really see that it is a common theme. Preach the kingdom, heal the sick, cast out demons. But what makes it complicated is... We read our experiences into the scriptures and see, we don't see it happening. It's not happening. And since it's not happening, there's obviously something has changed. And so we create theology saying that these things don't apply for today. Uh, I might have fallen in that trap had my son not been healed. If I didn't see some amazing, miraculous event where God personally intervened in the life of one of my children... I might have doubted that these things were for today, too, because I never saw anybody get healed, ever, okay? In fact, even when I was in Kenya, I did not see healing except for that imam's child. That was the only time I saw somebody get healed until something got activated, okay? And truly, what got activated, honestly, it wasn't, it was I emptied myself, and then he started operating. And I do not believe I was operating in the gift of healing. Okay? I do now, but I wasn't then. Okay? And I want to explain that to you. <clears throat> because there are people in this room that are going to say, I can't do what you're doing because you have the gift of healing and I don't. And I'm going to say, nope. I'm going to say, not that way. And let me explain why. Because I read to you, or I touched on Luke chapter 10, where he sent them two by two, 70 others. So it began with the one, Jesus. Then we had the 12. Then we had 70 others. So now we got lots of people who are going out there healing people. Now, I'm confident they were healing people, even though it doesn't say they did. But this is why I'm confident. Because Jesus told them, heal the sick. He didn't tell them pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick and declare the kingdom of God is upon you. Now, if I pray for somebody to be healed and they're not healed, then I declare, the kingdom of God is upon you. How do I look if they're not healed? I look like an idiot, don't I? Do you think Jesus sent out 70 others to look like idiots? No. I don't think so. And when they gave the report that even the demons believe, that just presupposes that the sicknesses believed, uh, uh, they, they, that the demons obeyed, I mean. That the sicknesses obeyed too. Because the same authority, when he was talking to the twelve. That was over the sicknesses, diseases, and the demons. The same authority. It's by the authority of the name of Jesus that they were healing people. And so I ask you now, how many of those 70 had the gift of healing? You said all? All? Everybody's saying all. Okay, hate to disappoint you, you're wrong. None of them had the gift of healing. Why? Because it says Jesus went on high to the Father to distribute gifts to men. And that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit was sent, power was sent on high to be my witnesses here, there, and everywhere. Not one of them had the gift of healing. And now people are very confused. You will not be soon. Okay? Because that's the point. They did not have the gift of healing, yet they were still healing people. That's why you can too. When you understand how they were healing people, they were healing people by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? The authority of the name of Christ, not the gift of healing. It was not the gift of healing. That is a unique, separate thing. Okay? And so, let me explain to you how the authority works. I'm going to tell you a story about Peter. Peter one day was in the boat with the other 11, and Jesus was walking on the water. And when Jesus approached the boat, Peter said, they were scared, and Peter said, if it's you, tell me to come. And now that's the strangest thing. Remember, read it like a child. And wonder to yourself, why would Peter say that? If it's you, tell me to come. Anybody? Think about it, okay? Imagine 
if Peter was impulsive, because he was a pretty impulsive guy, and he steps out in the water without asking Jesus to tell him to come, what would happen if he just stepped in the water? It would have been one wet, dead Peter. 300 feet down. Okay? And so, once Jesus told him to come, then Peter started to walk out. And what happened when he looked around? He sank. Why? What? That's, that's a good way of putting it. But because... He lost faith. He lost faith. So what activated his authority? His faith. That's what activated his authority. When he lost faith, it went away. So now, Jesus said, he grabbed him by the hand. Well, first Peter said, save me. And then Jesus grabbed him, brought him in the boat, and he said, good job, Peter. At least you tried. No, he rebuked him. Okay, now I'm thinking to myself, these other 11 bums are sitting here in the boat and they don't even have the gall to get out and then Peter's the one with the courage to actually step out and to go in the water and he starts walking but he loses faith and he sinks of course we know the drill and yet none of them gets chastised only Peter gets yelled at and I'm thinking to myself this just isn't fair and so what's going on here why did Peter get chastised and not the other 11? Okay, it's good, but there's a, there's, a, there's a more direct answer. He was commanded to come. He was disobeying a command. As soon as Peter was given the command to come, it gave him the authority to walk on water, activated by faith. He had the ability to walk on water because Jesus told him to. None of the other guys could walk on water, nor could he if Jesus had not told him to. But as soon as he was told to come, he had the ability to walk on water. Activated by faith. The authority is Jesus Christ. If Jesus says do it, you got the ability to do it. If Jesus said do it, you don't have to ask nothing. Do it. Okay? That's why you have to believe that we were commanded to heal the sick and cast out demons. If you don't believe that you've been commanded to do it, you don't have the authority to do it, and you won't be able to activate it by faith. The only reason for, for years I was healing people is not because I had the gift of healing. That came way later. It's because I believed I was commanded to do it. And because I believed I was commanded to do it, I can do it. And as soon as I lose faith, doesn't work. Doesn't work. Just like Peter. Doesn't work. And so, as soon as this is another important point, when Peter asked Jesus to do what he was commanded to do, he was rebuked. He was rebuked. There's a, there's a point there that's kind of... I, I'll, I'll teach another teaching and come back to that. Because what do we do when we pray? We were commanded to heal people. But what do we do? Lord, please heal this person. We ask God to do what we were commanded to do. But he said, I've given you authority over these sicknesses. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and lo, I am with you always till the end of the age. We're to command the sickness to go away, just like a demon. Same authority over the demon is the same authority over sickness. Guys, I prayed for people to be healed for over 20 years, and I've not seen people healed. And a couple years ago, when I understood these things, I started commanding sicknesses to go away, and they started going away. Seriously. It's that simple. It's really that simple. Understanding the authority is vested to all who have been commanded to do something, and it's activated by your faith. And I'm going to write an equation on the wall here. I, I told you I'm a geophysicist, so I like math equations. So there's an equation that describes healing perfectly. And the reason I came up with this thing is because one day I wrote on Facebook, I said, you're a part of the equation. For healing, you're a part of the equation. You can't just rely on God to do everything. You are a part of it. And then I thought, 
I beg you, I can write an equation. Let me think of all the different variables and how they interrelate with one another. And I was able to come up with something that perfectly describes every person that I have prayed for, whether they were healed or not. Perfectly. And it describes every passage in the Bible that just talks about healing too. Perfectly. And so I'm going to share that with you, and then we're going to go through all the different passages in the Bible and explain to you how to perform healing. Now, first of all, you've got to get over this fake humility that says God does everything. It goes without saying. All of it is by the authority of the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's activated by faith in him. Okay? So when you say you command a sickness to go away, that's what's behind it all. If you try to do it without Jesus, it's not going to go far. Ask the seven sons of Sceva. It doesn't go very well. Okay? And they were even trying to use the name. Okay? But there was no Holy Spirit. Big problem. Okay, so they didn't get very far. So that goes without saying, because you'll find many examples of people being healed. Many were being healed by the hands of the apostle. I mean, it says it. So you don't have to hide behind the reality of how God did it. You know what I'm saying? And so, because, you, you know, you can say, you, if an evangelist goes out and shares, the, you know, the Lord, you know, the, the word of the Lord with somebody, and then they, they repent, You'll say, wow, this person went out and they were saved. You know, they preached the gospel to them. But if somebody prays for somebody to be healed and you say, oh, he, he went out there and he healed them. We know God healed them. Right. We know. It goes without saying. Okay? But the point is, you've been commanded to heal. Because Jesus told the 70, heal the sick. It was a command to them to heal them. They were commanded to heal them. It didn't say, go pray for them so God could heal them. And so when you're commanding, it's directed. Okay? God put something in. You are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. So when you heal somebody, it's Christ healing them. Okay? Let's just do it that way, and then you can feel better. Okay? But the point is, I want you to understand so it can be activated. Because it needs to get activated. Because until you see healing, you won't believe it. Okay? And so you have to step out. Because faith is something that does not, you can't buy it. Faith is developed. Faith is like a muscle. It grows with time. And so you have to grow your faith. And so you don't run to the cancer patient and then pray for them and then nothing happens and then all of a sudden you say healing doesn't work. No, you need to start with the headache. You need to start with the backache and the twist sprained ankle and things like that. Build your faith. And as soon as your faith is activated to one level, it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. You heal one headache, you can heal all headaches. Heal one backache, you can heal all backaches. And it keeps and you keep working out, flexing those muscles, and you work up. And there's a way that you can develop so you'll get more faith. Okay? And you keep developing your faith, and then sooner or later you're doing much more than you thought was possible. And so there's a way to do that, and I'm going to explain it. Because the things I do now are ten times what I was doing six months ago. And then ten times what I was doing a year ago. Okay? The healings I see now. But I'm still not healing cancer patients. But we are seeing people who are paralyzed walk. We have three of them now. I've seen the legally blind people see perfectly. I've seen mute boys speak. I've seen a broken arm healed. Okay? Literally broken. Okay? So those are things are way above my level of comprehension of possibilities. You know what I'm saying? And so those are examples, but the lion's share are backaches, headaches, different things. But, but I'll tr truly, people attribute more healings to me because of what I do with my wife with deliverance. Because a lot of people have sicknesses and problems that are just related to demons. When we do the deliverance, we're able to address the sicknesses. And so... To them, it's a report of healing, but for us, it was really deliverance, okay? And if anybody listens to me very carefully when I'm praying for healing, I do a deliverance first. I, I address that issue first, you know, because if I just pray for healing and there's a problem with a curse or witchcraft or a demon, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem, okay? So I get that out of the way, okay? So 
we're going to look at the equation so that when I, when I have the equation up here, all the factors I'll bring in from the Bible after. Okay? So healing okay, equals. Okay. First of all, it's with respect to time. All the variables of somebody's particular healing at this moment in time is the way those variables are now, but they can change. Because what if the situation changes four days from now as far as the inputs to that healing? Then the results of that healing can change too. I want you to understand that. Okay? So I'm going to say with respect to time equals, first of all, we have God's input into the equation. So we're going to say the power of God. Okay? When I'm all done with this, you can snap a photo. It'll just be one simple equation. By the way, you won't find this in a book. Uh, it's not in that book either. This is way after that stuff. Okay, so now the power of God has two variables. There are two things that drive God's power into, into the situation. One is he does things for his glory, God's glory, for the glory of God. Okay, this is the driver, for example, for that imam's child. He was demonstrating his presence, his power, his truth. So during evangelism, the primary driver is God showing he is God. Do you understand? Nearly every example in the Bible, that is the driver. When Jesus healed people, it was for the glory of God. It was showing that he was who he said he was. When Paul and John and Peter healed people, it was always demonstrating the power of the name. Right? Okay? Or when the 70 went out. Okay? One thing they all have in common. When you're demonstrating the glory of God, you have to show a change. And so those healings are typically immediate. Are you getting me? They're typically, boom, you see a change. By the way, this factor here, so with respect to time, there is nothing in the Bible to demonstrate whether people's healings were sustained or not. We only see what happened the moment they prayed. We never see what happened the next day, the week after, the month after, or two years later. We really don't know. Okay? So, it, so there's no information whatsoever. But I know in real life, a lot of people you pray for healing, a week later, those problems can come back. And there's two different reasons, and I'm going to cover both of them here, because there's something you can do about both of them, okay, to make things not come back, okay? Okay? And so it's strange because the Bible's silent on that subject, but in real experience with everyone I know that has any experience with healing sees, yeah, they were healed, but then a week later it came back, and they wonder why. Well, there's reasons here. You'll see them. The other one is the will of God. The will of God. God heals people because he loves you and he wants to improve your life and he wants to bless his children. Okay, this one is typically for the saints, for the believers. Okay, now when we pray for healing for believers, it often behaves completely differently because you already believe. You already believe that God is God. You already have been saved. So this is primarily to improve your life. You understand? You've been crying out to him. You've been suffering. You've been having challenges in your life. So the main driver for believers is to bring improvement to their life. Does that make any sense? Okay? And so, this one, when we look at scriptures, there are precious few examples. They're not there. But there are teachings about it. Because it says, these things will accompany those who believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Recover describes a process, a process, 
The other one is, if somebody among you is sick, get the elders of the church to lay hands on them, and they will be restored. It's suggesting a process, not an immediate event. I see this in the field, guys. When I am doing evangelism, I see people healed. Period. Boom. Healed. Something demonstrable that they can point that God is God and he is real and that the message I'm preaching is true. And I'm talking, I'm talking 100%. I'm talking everybody I pray for. Not everybody gets 100% healed, but there's 100% measurable, remarkable change that they will say, wow, God is God. Okay? 100%. Okay? I, I've been saying like 90%, but really I've been saying it wrong. You know why? Because not everybody is 100% healed, but 100% of them have a measurable change, a real change, a remarkable change, okay, that they know God is real, okay? But among the saints, uh-uh, totally different animal, totally different animal. I see a lot of the smaller things, back aches, knee aches, leg aches, you know, all the smaller things, I see a lot of those people immediately healed. But I also see a lot of people, they recover. They get better. They get better. They don't get this immediate miraculous event. And then they recover in over a few days. But here's where maybe my brother will, be, will attest to this. In the East or in East Africa specifically, and in the Bible, you see the concept, the worldview is spiritual rather than materialistic. And in this country, if you look at the weather and it's raining, they will say it's because of the barometric pressure, the temperature, and the relative humidity. And in Kenya, they'll say, God made it rain. They'll say, God made it rain. Guess who's right? They are. We can only measure the temperature, barometric pressure, and relative humidity. We cannot change it. We cannot change it. All we can do is take a measurement. They are right. God made it rain. And so with our Western world view, we think that things that have some natural involvement are not God healing. But on my side, when somebody gets malaria and their dog's sick, they're dying, and they crawl to my door, and I give them malaria medicine, and in three days they get better. They come to church on Sunday and testify, God healed me. Are you understanding me? It's not a cop-out. It's real. It's real because you cannot pick how God will heal you. If he uses nutrition, exercise, surgery, medicine, or sub-doctor intervention, it is still God healing you. Are you getting me? Okay? And so I see a mix of miraculous intervention, recovery, but I do see people healed. But guess what? At some day, it, it doesn't work. Because every single one of you is going to die. One day you're going to pray and it doesn't work. You understand? Just because God can heal, he doesn't. Sometimes he takes us home. Okay? All of us will die one day. That's a reality. And so regardless of all the intervention and all the things, and there's plenty of examples. If people say that everybody should be healed or whatever, I know people say that. Guess what? Paul was very sick, and that's why one of the churches received him. Epaphroditus almost died, and that's something that was sorry. Timothy had a problem with his stomach. Paul had a thorn in his side. We don't know if it was a sickness or whatever, but it's there. The point is they had some things that they couldn't get rid of and they couldn't deal with. And to me, I can't even pray. I can't pray for myself. You, you read my Facebook. People are like, why is this guy always sick if he's healing everybody? You know what? I do it to myself. And when you read this equation, you'll understand why. Because you psych yourself out. Since I've never healed myself, I can't. I do it to myself. I do it to myself. Somebody, a brother asked me for prayer last night for his ears. And I'm like, going in, I'm like, that's one thing. I made, I made the mute speak. I made the blind see. Broken arm, paralyzed walk, never been able to touch an ear. So in my heart, my faith is defeated for healing an ear. Defeated. Now my wife is deaf right now. Can't touch it. I have one deaf ear too. Can't touch an ear for some reason. 
because of my own faith, my own weaknesses. It's not God's power. So when we look at the equation, God's power, so, so you understand this is more immediate, demonstrating the glory of God. If you go out and do evangelism, minister to non-believers, healing. By the way, I just want to make this point for every evangelist here. You do not separate healing, deliverance, and preaching. They all go together. It doesn't matter which one you lead with, but don't neglect one for the other, and all three are for making disciples. So evangelism is not something you do at a faraway place in a vacuum and then you run away on an airplane. If you're not making disciples, you're doing nothing. You're doing absolutely nothing. If you go preach to somebody a thousand miles away and then you leave them, or short-term missionaries, people who go to countries and then do a little work for a couple weeks and run away, guys, save your money. Save your money. It won't accomplish anything. Really. Making disciples is a long-term investment. It takes time. And so you really need to go and invest in people's lives. So do this work in the context of making disciples. Really be honest with yourself and ask you how much fruit has been laid down. And, and don't just take people's reports for it. But actually go on the ground and check what's there. And you'll see these short-term things, doing big meetings or this. Open-air meetings and public preaching is designed to, uh, to, to uh, you need to identify the man of peace. Somebody that you'll go to their home, minister to them and their people around them, and continue the work with them. You want to plant a church and make those people strong and obedient to Christ. So doing it absent that, you're spending a lot of time and money, but you're probably not going to get any long-term fruit. So you need to have boots on the ground to do that work. And I'm just speaking from experience because I've seen tons of people spend a lot of money doing other things, and, and there's nothing to show for it. They think it's there. But if you really go on the ground and check what's there, it's not. It really isn't there. Okay? Because I'm on the ground. I know what's there. And I know all the people that come, they go, and there's nothing there. Nothing. A lot of good actors, even, even people that are close to me that have been doing that work, that are visiting for a month, and then they go for, for 11 months, there, there's nothing there. Nothing at all. Okay? So be very careful. Don't waste your money. It makes you feel good. You sleep at night thinking you're doing a lot for the Lord. But if you go on the ground, there's nothing there. So, okay, that was free. But what we want to do is heal the sick, preach the kingdom, cast out demons all together. And it doesn't matter which one you lead with. Uh, doing deliverance is a personal thing. I, I typically don't do it in a public setting. I don't deliver non-believers unless they're ready to be saved. I don't want to, like, open them up. They're just going to get reattacked. They have no defenses. Okay? And so, honestly, I can't say I agree with what Jesus was doing. He was delivering people. There's a couple things Jesus did that I feel weird about. I'm, I, they're, they're actually really uncomfortable to me. He, he, took, he took the demons out of those men and put them in the pigs. Then the pigs died. Where do you think they went? And I'm like, Jesus, get rid of them, will you? Now you got 2,000 people with demons running around in them. And I feel very uncomfortable about that. I mean, Jesus is Jesus. Maybe he was showing us for some other reason. But I didn't understand it, so I personally don't like doing that. We've had demons. I've, I've chased demons from people. And then we did not do anything with them. We just chased them out of the person. Those demons visited me at night, hitting me on the side and shaking my bed, going to my son's room and things like that. I don't like that. I prefer that I get rid of them and they're gone. That's my personal preference, <laughs> you know? So, just my personal preference. So, I, I'm, be, I'm just being honest. I shouldn't criticize Jesus, but I'm telling you, there are some things he did that I don't fully understand. Okay? That's all I'm saying. He did. He, but he's Jesus. He did no wrong, trust me, but I don't understand it. That I can say. But, anyway, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a lot of backlash for that one. That one's on video. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but I don't understand. I really don't understand why he did that. Yeah, no, I'm definitely honest, because when I got visited at night by demons, I didn't like it. So I don't. I want those demons gone permanently. Okay, so when you look at this equation, you get a drink of water, just turn my cough drop. Uh. Okay, so this is God's part, and it's multiplied by our part, which was faith. Faith, but whose faith? Whose faith? First, let's look at some examples, because 
We have the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. She touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and he didn't even know. Or the man, the, the, the people that were walking in the shadow of Peter. Peter didn't know. I doubt he was going trying to get his shadow to touch them, you know. Or Paul's handkerchief. People were being healed. Okay? And so I'm wondering to myself, whose faith is it? Well, you can see in those examples it was the faith of the patient. But it wasn't only the patient's faith, because you have other people. For example, the one, the cripple, uh, the cripple in, I believe, the temple courts with uh, Peter. He asked Peter for money, and then and John, and he said, you know, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have is, and he healed him. That guy didn't want healing. The only thing he was looking for was money. In fact, he got what he wasn't asking for. So it wasn't his faith, it was completely the faith of the healer, right? But then what about the, the four men who were lowering the paralytic from the roof? And they lower him down. It was his four friends that had the faith. And so it was the faith of the witnesses. Okay? Faith is cumulative. It doesn't matter whose faith it is, as long as there is sufficient faith and sufficient power of God when they are multiplied to overcome the obstacle. Bigger obstacle takes more faith you know, or more power, one or the other. It doesn't matter which one it is. And that's why Jesus says some take prayer and fasting. Why? Prayer and fasting increase God's power and increase Faith of the healer. Prayer and fasting will increase. The, when you call upon God, he can apply more power if you ask him. You understand? And then when you fast and pray, you empty yourself and your faith builds up. The power of the Spirit comes up in you. And so prayer and fasting can increase both variables. And so you can accomplish a bigger thing. A bigger thing can be accomplished. And so faith... It's like a muscle. So when about a, about a year ago or eight months ago, I started exercising a little because I was getting really tired and weak. And it happened that it, it had more to do with some sicknesses that I had. I, I get malaria and it's not treatable. It doesn't go away with medicine. And so finally I, I figured something out that works with some new medicines and all that. So, but, but exercising helped me a little. And at first I did push-ups and I did eight push-ups. I thought I could die. And then the next time I did four and I thought I was dead. Okay? But then after that I started increasing. And it went up to like 20, 25, 30. And we were doing how many you can do in 30 seconds, but at first I couldn't even get to 30 seconds. Okay? And then at some point I, could, I made it to 52 push-ups in 30 seconds. Seriously, this fat little body. Boop, 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 boop. I got it on video if you don't believe me. But uh, I could beat every single one of the youth in our church. Beat them all in arm wrestling, too. This little guy. Yeah. I'm more determined. More determined. I'm probably not stronger, but I'm a heck of a lot more determined because I'm not going to lose. Okay? So my son could do 51. He was close. But, and he's in perfect shape. And I'm like, I'm in a good shape. I'm in very good shape if round is a shape. So, so anyway... It didn't happen overnight. That took several months of working up. It would be like, and near the end there, it was like 46, then 47, 48, and then, man, 48, 47, 49. You know, it kept, it went up slowly. And that's what it is with faith. You keep pushing the envelope. And so you work something that is manageable, and you keep working up. And I'm going to describe how to do that very practically because I have a lot of field experience. And when we kept doing it, doing it, you'd see the ways that it would work. You know, and you identify uh, ways to increase the faith in the room. Because you can manipulate the situation to make it so you can heal something that you otherwise can't heal, for real. I've seen people healed from big things that there's no way I could have healed them because I didn't have sufficient faith, okay? Uh, before I explain what that means is, it's plus or minus C. Curses. 
there's witchcraft or curses. That's why I do the deliverance first. Because I could do all this, but there's still something that will prevent overcoming the healing. So you have to do the deliverance first. If it's witchcraft and you get rid of whatever demon's causing it, and you heal the sickness, okay, then that sickness will, will be gone. Okay? But if you get rid of the sickness, but then there's still this witchcraft against him, it'll reactivate it, reactivate it, reactivate it. Or it could be a generational curse or whatever it might be. And so you have to do the deliverance first. Get rid of this factor first. Then all you have to do is try to get sufficient faith. And if you can get sufficient faith, you will overcome that sickness. Okay? So there's many ways to do it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about all the different ways of increasing the faith because you want the maximum faith. First of all, to develop your own faith, start with simple things. Pray for headaches, backaches, pains, things that are smaller. And command, don't ask. Command it to go away in the name of Jesus. Don't forget that. You've been given the authority, just command. Command it to go like it's a demon. I command all backache, go now in Jesus' name. Just command. Tell it to go away. Okay? And uh, for me, I pray, if you pray more than once, you add more faith to the equation. Okay? Now, if, you're, if it doesn't defeat you, okay? Like you're, you're still, you have resolve to keep trying, and it doesn't make you doubt. You can keep going as long as you want. I have African brethren that can pray for an hour, two hours. For me, I pray three times, and I'm like, well, I guess it's not going to work. And then I'm thinking if it's not, if I don't see any improvement at all, I give up after three times. I'm probably, I'm probably a wimp, but normally I see improvement. And if I see any improvement, I know I can finish the job. Any improvement. I know I can finish because I can keep chipping away at it because it's working. It's working. It's working. So I'll keep chipping away at it until there's no more improvement. Then I'm like, that's all I can do. Sometimes, the first time I healed somebody, I, okay, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Good. I had somebody that was hit by a car uh, on a motorcycle. His knee, hip, and ankle were damaged. And I think I already told you, I prayed for the hip first. It worked. Faith rising in him, faith rising in me. You're adding faith to the equation. Then the knee. Faith still rising. Prayed for the foot three times. It improved a lot, but didn't finish. I think probably because he had an open wound, and it still hurt. It was a cut that didn't, like, close on me, you know? And so that night, he felt something touch him, and it was warmth, and he was healed in the middle of the night, which gave me a lot. It was a faith booster for me because that was, like, the first time I prayed for somebody after I was reactivated. You know what I'm saying? And so then... I went after somebody who had uh, his, his muscle separated from his leg or something. Extreme pain. Doctors couldn't help him. He was healed. Then another guy had a leg injury from years ago. He was healed. And, then, and so it was all like in a two-day period. And I'm like, all right, I can do this, you know? But when you have a bigger problem, don't attack the whole thing at once. Attack piece by piece as part of it is healed. Your faith rises, the faith rises for the patient, the faith rises for the bystanders. And everybody's faith increases, and then you can take on a bigger challenge because you got more faith. It, it, you know, it's like the faith reservoir increases. That's, that's the way I describe it. And if you have multiple people, don't go after the hard one first. Go for the easy one with something you've done before. And then if when everybody sees that person healed, everybody's like going, oh, they're expecting to be healed. Then you can keep addressing bigger and bigger problems. Okay? The other one is when you're doing healing, you can never have too many people praying. All the faith you apply to it, the better. Okay? So if you have a group of people, pray together. But when you're doing deliverance, one person. One person doing deliverance. If you have multiple people hollering at a demon, that demon will listen to no one. Okay? They're like a child being yelled at mom and dad at the same time, and they just sit there saying, I don't know what to do. So you want one person doing a deliverance, but for healing, everybody praying at once. 
because the more faith you apply to it, the better. Okay? And you can keep going, keep going, keep going. Now, we've had people come to these meetings like in wheelchairs expecting to be healed. And I'm like, you have no idea. We've had three paralyzed people in Kenya that are walking. I, I have one on video. She, she was completely paralyzed, one side of her body, and she was walking. Okay? Uh, nobody knows that we went there three times. We had two deliverance sessions, one prayer session, and we had to keep chipping at it. You understand? It wasn't a one-time event that took five minutes. There was multiple people going multiple times. Okay? We kept chipping at it because it was a big H. It needed to be a big F and a big PG in order to bring about this major miraculous event. There was another one that we had an all-night prayer meeting with like 16 people. That girl was completely paralyzed and she was walking fine that night. Okay? Another one was somebody who had a stroke, one side of his body paralyzed. Four hours of prayer with those radical women intercessors. I wasn't there. And they just went at it, went at it, went at it, and that person walked. Okay? But it's not going to be coming in here and me doing a quick one-minute prayer because I typically pray for like 30 seconds. I'm like, in 30 seconds, that's about three tries. Okay? If I don't see the change, I trust and trust to the Lord. And I see a lot of people healed doing that. But these bigger problems will take a big investment. There will be prayer and fasting. There will be getting as many of your prayer warriors together at once. There will be sustained prayer. And you can do something big. When, you know, when uh, Peter was let loose from prison, there was a lot of people praying that night. They were praying. It wasn't just one person. That was a significant undertaking. And so when you got a big problem, you got a big H and a big F, you know, you got a big PG, you got to throw everything at it. Okay? And so, and you can see amazing miracles. When I say, paralyzed person walked today, you're thinking, I went there, laid hands on them, prayed for 12 seconds, and they walked. That didn't happen. It didn't happen. That was sustained prayer, sustained effort. The ones that are, that are typically healed immediately for bigger things, they are typically something that involve deliverance. Because when you get rid of a demon, like Jesus had a woman that was bent over for 18 years. She was delivered, guys. That wasn't a prayer for healing. He got rid of the demon and she was healed. You understand? Now, getting rid of demons for us is real-time science. There's no wiggle room. We know what we're doing precisely, and it goes. Okay? Healing is a bigger equation. And when you have a big problem, you have to have big inputs. Okay? But it's real, and it works, and it's true, and you should seek it and press in for it and expect healing. Okay? So I want you to understand how it works. Because some of you have prayed for somebody and they died. Guys, you had a big problem that probably required a lot more effort than you were putting into it. Okay? But at the end of the day, everybody dies. Maybe it was their time. You can't stop everything. They all die. Every one of the apostles died. A lot of them died horrible deaths. They were like, I mean, flayed. They were speared. They were burned. They were put on, you know, they were crucified upside down even, beheaded, stabbed. They were all dragged by a horse. I mean, these guys, guys, all the prayer in the world didn't stop those things. And they were the apostles. You understand? Sooner or later, it doesn't work. Peter was let out of prison that time, but there's a later time he wasn't let out. You understand? And so, uh, but that doesn't mean don't do it. We were commanded to do it. So command those things to go away. Somebody who has the gift of healing has a higher degree of success at healing, and they do use the gift. They ask the Holy Spirit to do the work. Okay? I use both hands. I say, go now in Jesus' name. I command this problem to go away in the name of Jesus. And then I pray, Lord, touch them. Holy Spirit, touch them. Heal them right now. Heal them right now in Jesus' name. And I'll pray both ways because I'm going to throw everything I got at it. I want it to work. So that's all I care about. And if I don't see any pro progress, I get defeated. And when the faith is down, nothing works. Nothing works at all. 
It just doesn't work. So I'm going to throw everything I have at it immediately. Okay? But just because somebody has the gift of healing doesn't mean everybody gets healed. Does a gifted evangelist save everybody they preach to? That's a joke, right? Just because you're gifted at doing something doesn't mean the results are always guaranteed. Because remember, the equation involves other parties. They are only this part of the equation. By the way, doubt is negative faith. It sucks the faith out of the room. That's why Jesus, when uh, Jairus' daughter, the 12-year-old who died, everybody was laughing at him, saying, she's dead, she's dead. And he said, she's not dead. And they laughed at him. He said, you guys stay out here. I'm going in here and raising her. Because they were, would have sucked the faith out of that room. Okay? And so you do not do healing around people that have no faith or total doubt about healing. Because you're going to defeat yourself. They're just not going to be healed. Okay? They're not going to be healed. And typically in Africa, if somebody comes with their hand out for medicine, I give them medicine. Because if this is what they believe in, give them what they're looking for. Because if you pray for them and they say they feel better, they say, well, are you going to give me the medicine? They still want it. That's what they came for. So you give them what they want. Okay? And so does that make sense? Does it make sense? Is this actionable? Can you do something? Okay? This is not too complex. It is quite simple. Okay? But always start with deliverances, which is what I'm going to teach next. And I actually am cruising along really quick. We're going to have a long, we're going to have a good question and answer session. So does anybody have any problems you want me to pray for? I can demonstrate. Anything? Don't bring me a cancer patient. <laughs> okay. What do you got? Shoulder. What's wrong with it? Uh, it's a car wreck. Okay. Pain. And just you just got pain. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna do a play by play here so you can understand. The first thing I'm gonna do is deliverance. Because maybe she's got a curse against her, she doesn't know. Curses come in three ways. Could be a curse of words. Somebody saying, Your life is never gonna go good. You know, that's enough to unleash a demon. Another one is witchcraft. She could be being witched, you know? Or the, the other one is, it could be generational. So the first thing I do is deal with deliverance. And since I don't, I'm not using my eyes to see what's there, so I'm going to try to catch everything. So I can say, I bind the strong man over her right now, and I bind the spirit with the highest authority that is causing any problems with his sh her shoulder right now, and come with all works, all effects, all orders. And I cancel any curses against her right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Go now into the pit with all works, all effects, all orders, with your entire kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay? So if there's anything there, boom, it's gone. It's cut out right now. Now, I'm going to pray for the actual healing. Where does it hurt? It hurts right now. Right now. I command any pain in the shoulder, or any injury or damage. I bind and rebuke you, and I command you to leave her body right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go now in Jesus' name. Any injury, any pain, any damage, go right now in Jesus' name. You're bound, you're rebuked, and I command you to leave her body right now. Holy Spirit, touch her shoulder. Touch her shoulder and bring healing to her muscles, healing to her ligaments, healing to any part of her body, tendons right now, muscles, ligaments, tendons, joints, cartilage, any damage, heal her right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. How does it feel? Check it, check it, check it. A little better. Okay, can move it like you want. Where's the injury? Point it out. In there. In there. Okay, so it's in the joint. In the joint. She don't know. Okay. Always good to get as specific as you can. Okay? So you always talk to the thing as specifically as you can. Any damage or injury in the nerves or the joint right now, I bind and rebuke you and I command you, leave her shoulder now. Leave her shoulder now. Leave her shoulder now. Leave her shoulder now. I command all pain, any nerve or joint injury right now. Go right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, touch her. Heal her shoulder. Heal her shoulder. Heal her shoulder right now in Jesus' name. Heal her now. Complete and total healing right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, try it now. It's not hurting. Okay, is it good? Okay, so you get as specific as you can. Ask questions about what is the problem. It's good. All right, good. Praise the Lord. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Okay. So, yeah. So the other, so when it didn't work, I tried to narrow in on where it was because the progress the first time was very, very slight. So that told me I'm targeting the wrong place. I had a woman once 
thing. My leg hurts. My leg hurts. Pray for my leg. And I'm praying. I'm praying. Nothing is helping. Then I realized she's got like a nerve pinched in her back. Yeah. Prayed for her back. Healed. Healed. So I wasn't talking to the right place. Injuries, sicknesses, they listen like they have ears. And they're obedient to what you are saying precisely. Now, if you have any pain, come back. Bind and rebuke it and command it to leave. Because watch this. Remember? Time. Today, my faith is what did it. Okay? I have a lot of faith. Okay? So she's healed because I'm here. And you guys kind of, we've read posts. Maybe some of you believe that I can do it. Okay? So you might have added faith to it. Okay? But tomorrow, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be in Pennsylvania. Okay? Tomorrow, a lot of you are going to be in Illinois. You're going to be in all your different places. So she's going to be alone. And so if she does not believe in her healing in two days from now, it can come back and she can start to doubt. And then it comes back and feels bad. So she has to say, go and leave me now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I am permanently healed in Jesus' name. And then it'll stay. It won't come back. Uh, she can do it. You can. What's your name? Angela. You guys can pray for Angela. Angela, keep praying. Okay, so, but that's how it's done. You can, for, so I did the deliverance first in case it was a curse. I have no idea. I didn't check, okay? And that's something is personal. I don't do that publicly. I never look at what's going on in people's personal lives publicly. By the way, we don't see sin. We see demons. We see spirits. So when, if somebody, somebody can be like, have their secret sin, we don't know what's there. If there's no demon associated with that sin, we have no idea what they're doing, you know? But if there is a demon of lust, we can probably guess they're doing something. You know, if there's a demon of anger, they probably have a problem with anger, you know? So even though we don't see their sin, if there's a demon that has a primary function, if it's in them, there's probably some activity there. When we see a spirit of some, oh, I'm not in deliverance yet. Let me come back to that. Not in deliverance. But this part permits us to be successful with this part. And it is that easy. Any Christian can do it. Any Christian can do that. You have to believe. I've healed many shoulders, many knees, many backs, all kinds of people going to the chiropractor every day. Uh, it's just gone. Completely healed. Okay? Yes. Oh, and check right away. You know, when you pray for somebody to be healed and say... You know, I pray for this arm to be healed in Jesus' name, and then you just walk away. They know you don't expect anything. But you say, how is it? Check it now. You want them to check it before and after. Because in the act of checking, that's when faith comes up. They're like, you actually expect this to get better. I'm like, I totally expect this to get better. You think I'm yelling at your arm for no reason? I mean, seriously, I'm, a, I'm an aggressive prayer. I yell at things. I want it to go away, and I command it to go away. Uh, there's, you know what? I, if my dog's like making a mess in the corner, I can say, you know, Rex, please stop. And it doesn't listen. But I say, Rex, get out of here. It listens. And so I, that activates my faith. You know, this might be strange to some people, but I do this every day. And it's normal. And it's kind of cool. It's fun. It's fun. Okay. Um, I'm done with, uh, with healing, and we're cranking. We're going to have a great question and answer session because I see that I am moving. My voice is excellent today, and I see uh, I'm moving along really quickly. Deliverance is probably the most interesting subject. Uh, it's the least biblically supported, so if you're one that only believes in the Bible, you might get some heartburn, but uh, we've, we've delivered at least 1,000 demons from people, so we have a lot of experience. And what we're going to tell you will work, and you will be able to do it even without the gifts. Okay? Just like you'll be able to heal people without the gifts. Okay? But I've also taught you how you can seek the gifts. How you can rise yourself to the occasion. Okay? Praise the Lord. Break time. You have been listening to Missionary Mark Carrier. Mark and his wife and family of 10 children are missionaries in Kenya. Mark is the founder of Kingdom Driven Ministries. His website is kingdomdriven.org. I highly recommend you go there. Click on Resource Library 
and download the free evangelism booklets, teaching guides, and Bible studies. He's got some other great resources there I think you will find worthwhile. They're all free. This message you've just been listening to is one in a series that he presented, and you can hear other messages in the series at www.livethebible.info. There's both audios you can listen to and download, and there's some videos of some of the messages also. Again, that's www.livethebible.info. Thank you for listening.